we're having a fair here because our museum is under renovation. So that's why everybody here has hats and coats. And that's also the noise that you hear in the background. It's a, it's a street fair. So cool. that's why you're hearing all of that. We're not just buck wild. We're having a street fair. Okay. All right. So I'm going to explain to the audience what we're here to do because you all already have the questions and then we'll start. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Hello. We have the pleasure today of having the Levine Museum with us in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we have a couple of goals. What we're trying to do is have a conversation about the um, issues that we have concerned about the same life activities with like minded organizations like the Levine Museum. So, our specific goal today are to have a conversation with like minded institutions about the importance of documentation. Life and legacy, promote educational programs and resources. So, we're going to be asking them about some of their educational programs and resources they offer to the community and the school. Um, and then we're going to communicate information about timely issues and create dialogue around that communication about the around those issues. And then we're going to explore how Dr. King may have felt about some of those issues. Okay? All right. So, let's start by just asking you all at the Levine Museum to explain um, who you all are, what you do, and, and a little bit about the museum. Uh, I'm Tom Hanchett. I'm staff historian at Levine Museum of New South in Charlotte. This is Janine Bryant, who's our vice president of education. And um, we are a history museum. We look at the South since the Civil War. And um, we tell, try to tell the stories of everyone who has shaped and is shaping the South. Black people, white people, natives, newcomers, young people, old people, men, women, you know, everything you can imagine, we're trying to tell those stories. And we are in a place where there are a lot of newcomers, uh, a lot of young people coming up in this community. It's a very young community, but also a lot of people coming from around the United States and from around the world. And so we've kind of boiled down what we do to using history to build community. Everybody comes to the story. If we can be the place where people share their stories, it's good for us, but it's really good for our community. Okay, so at the museum now, we're going through a, a, a process been really working to um, to promote equity education in the community uh, through social media, through programming. And so that's our big emphasis right now with our educational goals. What are some of your educational goals and some of your educational programs at your museum? So uh, good afternoon. I'm Janine Bryant. We are very much dedicated to using our educational programs to build community. So we have made a concerted effort to create dialogue opportunities with the community. Um, and to create opportunities for the community to react to the things that they see in exhibition at the museum. So um, an example of that, you guys were asking about examples of that. One example is the New Courage Project. So I'm holding up the actual um, brochure from that. But so we developed a collaboration with 10 high schools that were able to come and visit the museum at a supplemented cost. and. The educators partner with us to develop a curriculum. So that's an example of really going for grassroots, and the teachers created the curriculum, and we co-created with them. They also created a community response exhibit. So the the exhibit by creating pieces that talk to teens as well. We asked them to define courage, and they say things like, "It's wearing a hijab to school. Knowing people will think all the wrong things about you." So they. We used their quotes and we created the logo, the exhibition, the dialogue, the curriculum. And that's an example of the kinds of things that we try to do with the community when we are creating educational programs. Hold on one second. Okay. okay, all right. Maybe there was a lag with you. So we, we heard about the logo. And so give us the last 10 seconds of what you're saying. I was just saying that not only the logo, but the students created the exhibition, the final exhibition project um, as well. The teachers created the curriculum, and it was something that became a holistic community experience. Uh, and that is pretty much how we designed our educational programs 
here at Levine Museum. It's very much a co-creation process with the community. And what demographic do you serve at your museum? Do you have more of a local population, an international population? Do you have a, a lot of inner city participation? What's your demographic look like? Um, all of the above, I guess. Um, we are not um, a city like Memphis where there are a lot of tourists coming. Um, many of our uh, visitors are people who are from this region, from this city, from this area, though they are newcomers themselves. So um, they, they have a lot to learn about each other. Um, we have, um, over the 20 years we've been around, almost every year we have had more people of color coming through our doors than that percentage in the population. So we feel that, that we're getting a handle on, on telling diverse stories and, and engaging people um, no matter where they're coming from. Okay. Now, in our audience, you've heard it back. We have some, audio, some audience, audience members here. I think you can see them. I'm going to ask them if they're interested in presenting a question, that they write it down, and then I'll read it out to you to make sure that we're you know, addressing the questions that our audience members might have. So Peter's going to come around with some index cards and pins. And write your questions down, and then you'll get to me, and I will read them. And then if you don't feel comfortable writing them down, you can just raise your hand, and I'll call you to get the question, your question answered. Okay? So as you all know, today is also our inauguration, the second inauguration for our first African American president. That's a really big deal today, and and, a, and it's also happening at the same time as King Day. Okay. Any questions or any comments about how they feel Dr. King would react or feel about issues going on today and how he think how he would think those issues should be addressed in uh, President Obama's second administration? Any questions about that? Any interest in that? What about at the museum? Are you all how how do you all feel Dr. King would feel? or would address issues today, in, or ask Mr. Obama to address issues today in his second administration? Well, I, I can answer that, I think, two different ways. Um, I am nearly 60 years old. I grew up in white segregated schools in the South. And I think that if um, Dr. King was here today, he would be amazed um, that the world looks much more like his vision than um, it seemed like it possibly could um, when I was six, eight, 12 years old. So um, a lot of changes. But um, on the other hand, I think Dr. King would be giving us a hard time. Um, he's good at that. Um, uh, he, he um, toward the end of his life, was, was coming out against the Vietnam War, which was not a popular thing to take a stand on. People said, you know, why, why are you doing that when all the black-white problems are not solved? Uh, so I think if he was here today, that he would be pushing us to deal with school resegregation, which is going on in many of our communities. I think he would be pushing us to deal with the issues of immigration, which is an, a new thing in much of the South. Um, up until about 20 years ago, Charlotte had very, very few immigrants. And that's true of much of the South. Um, in the last 20 years, the South has become the number one immigrant gateway, the fastest growing part of the United States in terms of immigrant population, folks coming here from all over the world, how do we become a community? That's the question that Dr. King was asking in his place and time. I think he'd be pushing us to ask it today. Okay, and then you have your, your the name of your museum is very interesting. You're the Levine Museum of the New South. How does your New South compare with, this, with Dr. Martin Luther King South? The New South is an old term. Historians um, point back to the 1860s. At the end of the Civil War, Southern leaders said, whoops, we lost. Um, we got to reinvent who we are and move from being a, a, a region just of farms to be a region of cities and factories. Slavery was gone. The economy had to be reinvented. Society had to be reinvented. And so this, this reinventing is this New South. Uh, people keep saying, you know, we're almost there. We're, we're we see the New South in front of us. Um, I think when Dr. King was here, that, that New South was a South where black and white interacted in a, in a much better way. 
uh, I think we have moved in that direction. But as I say, um, you know, we have more new sounds to invent. Okay, hold on one second. We lost we lost your voice. Hold on one second. Hold on. We're getting it back. All right, go ahead. Give us the last five seconds. Sometimes we get a delay. Okay. Um, the um, the essence of the New South is this region that keeps reinventing itself. And in Dr. King's lifetime, that meant black and white relations changing. Um, today, um, that's still an issue, obviously, but now we have people from all over the U.S., people from all over the world. How do we build community? That's the next new South, I think. Okay. And then um, we have a question from the audience about um, our economy and about uh, issues of poverty today. With your, how does your museum address issues of poverty? great question um and, uh, let me just clarify as you saying issues of poverty as poverty as it exists in the community or issues of poverty as of uh, accessibility to the institution however your museum addresses issues of poverty do you all address issues of poverty um yes i would say th through the issue of accessibility okay. um and that's how that's how we can directly address it and sustainably address it um, so there are times when we have done exhibits that directly relate to um, the impo like impoverished community. So we did an exhibit about the working poor here in Charlotte. So that those were people like uh, teacher assistants and bus drivers who could be living and working in our community every day and not have enough money to be able to feed their children and keep a roof over their head. So we've done exhibits like that in the past, but a sustainable effort, I would say, is our um, not only our community days, but our we have we're free every Sunday. Um, and so that we wanted to create a level of access to our community um, that actually isn't really seen in any other institution in Charlotte. Um, we're free. A lot of institutions are free, but they usually do it in the evenings. Um, so you might have someone who's uh, an institution that's free from five to nine on a Tuesday evening. Um, we wanted to create access on a day where families could come and enjoy the museum and learn from it together. And so we are free every Sunday. That's one way that is sustainable action for us that has been ever since I've, I've been here for about a half years and it has been ever since we started, since I started working here. Okay, hold on, wait, 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 wait. We're losing you again. We're losing your voice again. Peter? Oh, sometimes it's, maybe it's just a, a delay. Give us the last five seconds. So you, you're talking about the free days, the last five seconds. Uh, we were just saying that that's been a sustained effort ever for at least five and a half years, probably much longer than that. Um, it's been a sustained effort to make sure that the museum is free and accessible on Sundays. Today, we are free on Martin Luther King's birthday, and we've been doing that for a number of years. It's become our largest day of the year, and it's a day when we get a very diverse audience, but a lot of it's hard to tell, but I think a lot of low-income people who normally would not come to a museum on this particular day, because this day in our culture is so focused on history, they've heard that Levine Museum is open and will have 2,000 people today. Um, people often, I think, who are here in a museum for the first time in their lives, um, whole families coming as one. And so that that's a very um, tangible way, as Janine says, to to, um, to dig into the, the issues of poverty. And how is your museum and corporate uh, collaborating to the King Day efforts with the inauguration? Are you doing anything with to collaborate the two in Charlotte today? Um, I would, I'm gonna say that we're doing it from a kind of a larger national perspective. We have just opened an exhibit called Fighting for Democracy. Um, and so we're using uh, this MLK Day to really think about how we define democracy. Um, and in Obama's uh, inauguration speech, he really was challenging notions of democracy and really challenging people to uh, stand up and to get to get into action. And we're trying to do that same thing today, um, not only through the exhibit, but through the programs and through the workshops that we have offered today. Okay. And in Memphis, we are at the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. We're trying very hard to create advisory boards for uh, like our equity education initiative that are comprised of people from various backgrounds and from various organizations within the community. We've got a question from the audience um, asking, how should community leaders 
keep from having a de facto effect in the community? First, we can start with your, your museum. How, do you, how are you ensuring that you're reaching out to all of your community members? This is something that uh, we work very hard on, um, beginning with our board, uh, because we're a fairly young institution. Um, we started in 1991 with a board that looked like our community. Um, at that point, Charlotte was about 25% people of color. That was our board, half male, half female. That's very unusual that in museums, and both Janine and I are lucky that those folks are our bosses. Uh, we are now even more diverse than that because Charlotte has become more diverse. So that's that's part of the answer. Um, we are, we try to be very strategic about um, inviting, I mean, and very strategic and very transparent with our community when we're talking about um, gathering community opinions and gathering community support. And, and so we are very transparent in all our communication about needing to represent and to look like Charlotte um, and to make everyone feel welcome and that this is a place all people can convene. Um, that is not always comfortable for people. It's not always easy, um, but it is one way to be very strategic about representing your community because we're looking at not only from the board, we're looking at staff diversity. How do you and how do you define diversity as well? And we want to be representative of our community. Um, Charlotte has experienced a lot of population change in the last 20 years, and um, we try to be very cognizant of that. Janine always works with teacher advisory groups when she's putting together um, uh, education projects. Uh, when we do exhibits, at every stage of exhibit development, we'll bring in people. Um, and um, we don't do it scientifically, um, but it turns out that through word of mouth, through our, our connections, we're able to bring in people who really do you know, come back in our face about you know, this group needs to be represented, this way of looking at things need to be represented. And because we do it at every stage in every project, one, people kind of are starting to trust us, and the other is that they expect this, and so they come to us saying, you know, we would like such and such to happen. Okay, wait, one second, one second, one second. All right, so pick up now, it's just a lag. So if I so sometimes I'll stop you to let the computer catch up, and then I'll just say, "Okay, go ahead now." <laughs> right. Okay, and so we have some questions from our audience members that seem to be centered around a concern about violence, um, violence um, with Trayvon Martin uh, based on race, uh, violence with um, the killings of the uh, the poor children in um, Connecticut, in, 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 yeah, Newtown, and then. Um, and the children, the people at the muse at the movie theater, just some general comments about how your museum is addressing or, or helping people work together as a community to avoid issues of violence or addressing issues of violence. Are you doing anything with issues of violence in your community at your museum? Um, yeah, in fact, we just literally just finished in December hosting uh, Without Sanctuary, which is actually an exhibit all about lynching. Um, and in hosting that exhibit, we had to address issues of violence, not only historically as they were presented in the images um, and the postcards of people who were lynched, um, but also we had we, we made a, a decision um, as an institution to look at it and address it from what is the cultural relevance today and how do we see this kind of violence reenacted over and over again so that people are left without sanctuary even today. Um, and so we are very interested. We didn't take it from um, the perspective of just the violence and the victimization. We also wanted to look at who is it that perpetrates the violence. So we did a lot of examination of mob mentality and uh, the community psychology behind uh, something that lets something happen like that, that lets like a lynching happen, for instance. That's an example of violence. We also asked our community to respond to us on how they plan to um, act ways that stand up for those who are without sanctuary. We also created um, postcards, and I have some examples of them here, um, that asked our community to either write a postcard to someone who was lynched, um, or to take these postcards and mail them with these commemorative quotes that, ask th that say things like, we must remember, because if the world forgets evil, evil is reborn. 
So we are literally asking our community to not only reflect on issues of violence in the community, but to ask them how do they plan to change it? Okay, and then we have one more question from the audience. Earlier you spoke about a book that you were creating with schools, and one of our audience members wants to know uh, where did those, where were those schools from? Did you have any schools from Memphis or, or Tennessee or Georgia, or are they all from the Charlotte area? We would have loved to have schools from Memphis or Tennessee or Georgia. Uh, we ended up working with our local uh, school board um, and partnering with one charter school as well. Um, it was important for this particular project that the students be able to visit the exhibit. But you make a really good point because there may be opportunities for us in the future to collaborate not only with schools that are in other states but across the nation. Um, we think about how to use like digital media as a platform to do that. Um, and we're working on that very hard. So thank you for that question. It's, it's definitely a push um, educationally for us to extend our outreach. We have uh, several traveling exhibits and uh, two are paired together. Um, one looking at uh, Brown versus Board of Education and the story of the family in our area that filed one of the first cases. And then we paired that with an exhibit that we created about the Mendez family out in California who helped integrate Mexican schools in California. Put the, those two on the wall and have discussions. We're sending those um, exhibits out, not just in our area, but are, uh, to anyone who would like them. So if, if that's something that's interesting, that's something that we're, we're working towards. Part of that project is now uh, in the Chicago area, um, opening next month. Um, and also we're working on a, a Latino project, which um, we are partnering with the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute and also with the Atlanta History Center in Georgia, trying to develop programs, exhibits, um, school-based stuff um, over the next three to five years that will address some of these things across the South. Right. So a regional perspective. Wonderful. Any more questions from the audience? Well, wonderful. We've been. Um, Sarah, did you, you want to yeah. talk about um, the initiatives uh, in Asia at all uh, that you were Skyping about? Sure. I can tell you quickly that I think, of course, everyone knows that uh, Dr. King had an effect uh, not only on the United States, but also around the world um, through the work that he did in Africa uh, and through sort of his uh, relationship. Um, his sort of philosophical relationship with Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, so we actually have programs um, all over the world that are working with Martin Luther King's legacy, uh, including in Asia most recently, we had a week-long youth camp um, to teach students about nonviolence um, and about sort of uh, addressing and accepting um, religious diversity, which has been a long-standing problem uh, in the continent of Asia. And so these students actually studied uh, the writings of Dr. King, of Mahatma Gandhi, of Nelson Mandela, uh, and sort of took a global perspective um, about these issues of equality and social justice um, in, order to, in order to address those contemporary issues today, you know, 10,000 miles away. Um, so I think that it's important to note that Dr. King's legacy doesn't only affect us here, but actually affects the entire world. Any more questions? I think that answered everything. Any more questions, Peter? Thank you all for, for participating with us today. Thank you for tolerating the noise of our street fair. <laughs> and in the future, we hope to actually have you here to be a part of our King Day. We're so glad that you all are having Wonderful. a wonderful King Day in Charlotte. And we thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to speak with us.